¿ya? Que, busca crear, que busca crear espacios en los que no domine ningún idioma, espacios en los que todos puedan participar con el idioma de su corazón. Para lograr este objetivo vamos a utilizar la función de interpretación de Zoom. Lo que verán en un par de minutitos es que aparecerá un nuevo botón que parece un globo terráqueo en la barra inferior de su pantalla. En esa misma barra donde tienen el botón del chat, del micrófono, del video, etc. Va a estar hacia su mano derecha. Cuando vean este nuevo botoncito aparecer, hagan clic en él y seleccionen inglés o español como el idioma en el que desean escuchar y participar. Si usted está en esta reunión por medio de una tableta o de un teléfono, encontrará las mismas opciones haciendo clic en el botón que tiene tres puntitos en la esquina inferior derecha de su pantalla. Este botón dice More o Más. Hi everyone, my name is Valentina and I'm here on behalf of Community Language Cooperative and I'm here to provide and guarantee your commitment to language justice. Language justice is a type of simultaneous interpretation that seeks to create spaces in which no one language is dominant, spaces in which everyone can participate with the language of their heart. So to achieve this objective, we will be using Zoom's interpretation feature. What you will see in a couple of minutes is that a new little button that looks like a globe will appear on the bottom bar of your screen. On that same bar where you have the mic, the video, the chat, and all of those other buttons, it'll be towards your right hand. When you see this button come up, go ahead and click on it and select either English or Spanish as both the language that you will be listening into and speaking into. If you're joining this meeting on a phone or on a tablet, you will find the same options by clicking on the button with the three little dots on the lower right hand corner of your screen. This button reads more. A quick reminder for those of you that will be using English as our main language for today's uh, meeting, Spanish is 20 to 25% longer than English. So please be aware of your speed. And if there's any text that hasn't been translated in advance of the meetings in PowerPoints or elsewhere in the chat box, wherever, please um, read out loud the main parts or we suggest that you read out loud most of the text so that I can interpret it in the other language so that no one misses any any of the content. If you're going to be using acronyms, please uh, spell them out the first couple of times to avoid any confusion among the listeners or myself. If you have any questions or any issues whatsoever with this technology, please let the whole group know by means of the chat box. Un breve recordatorio es que la interpretación es simultánea, entonces por favor recuerde mantener un ritmo de conversación cuando participe. Si tiene alguna pregunta o algún problema para con esta tecnología, por favor comuníqueselo al grupo completo a través del chat para que lo podamos resolver juntos. Muchas gracias por tenerme por aquí. Vamos a activar los canales de interpretación. Thank you so much for having me here. We can go ahead and start the interpretation channels. Yeah, and I'd like to, I see the first on my screen is Serafina. If you'd like to come off mute, introduce ourselves. We have Serafina, Aaron Reynolds, Ellie, and Aaron joining us as our guest speakers. Thank you, Anna. So glad to be here with you all. Good afternoon. I'm Serafina Lombardi. I come from a long line of subsistence farmers, and I'm still farming in Chimayo, New Mexico with my family. I used to be president of the Santa Fe Farmers Market, helped found a local vegetable growers co-op, and for the last 10 years, I've been serving uh, the New Mexico ASEC Association as our program director. And I came to this work specifically to help our local Indo-Hispano communities access uh, NRCS and FSA programs. That's the Farm Service Agency for FSA and NRCS's Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, I got a high tunnel through a NRCS program back in 2011, and since then I've been really happy to help others access these opportunities. Glad to be here and I'll pass it back to you, Anna. And Erin, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Uh, good afternoon and <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron Reynolds, and I am a resource conservationist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS, that I'm going to use on a regular basis. I am based out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I manage the EQIP program, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program and our emergency watershed protection program. Um, but my position is 
just specifically in the state of New Mexico, and it doesn't vary in other states. I have other counterparts in those states that do the exact same thing I do. And then we've got a farmer um, and really amazing co-founder of the organization that I, I draw a lot of inspiration from, Ellie, who's joining us from California. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for including me. My name is Ellie Igo. I join you from San Diego um, and the land of the Luiseno um, and or also known as, as the Paiomachia and that we are fortunate to rent our land from and exciting to talk to you about today um, today about NRCS and other programs that we've used to um, make our farm more resilient. Thank you, Ellie. And then uh, who I work the closest with, Erin, um, is our water director and helping to kick off this workshop series. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Hi, all. Nice to see you all. Thanks for being here, as Anna said. Um, my name's Erin. I am the water director for the National Young Farmers Coalition. Uh, so I'll be just sharing a little bit at the end about some other ways to plug in with our work and get more um, information like this one, but excited to be learning more about these NRCS programs. And without further ado, I am going to share just really quickly so you can all see the run of show today, our agenda. Um, we will dedicate a lot of time today to question and answers. If you have questions along the way for speakers and it's relevant, something that's top of mind, feel free to put those questions in the chat. Uh, I will make sure if the speakers can address that question immediately, that that is a question um, that I'll keep up as a log and we can come back to in, during the question and answer part of our agenda. Um, and I will also be helping our speakers keep track of time and uh, keep us moving. Um, so very quickly, and then Serafina is gonna get us started um, engaging all of you with a few questions. Our agenda is going to start with Serafina, and then we're going to have a few presentation slide decks shared um, that will all be sent to you later um, in an email. Um, so any of the information that you see today, you will have access to later on. We will also make sure to share our contact information. That way, if you have any questions that don't get addressed, that you will have a way to follow up with each of us after. Um, so today, we've done our welcome and introductions. Um, I'm going to go into why NRCS, share a little about who, who and what NRCS does. Uh, here's some testimonials from Ellie. Um, really give an overview of some of the existing programs in NRCS. Then we'll have time for question and answers and introduce our larger water campaign at the end and wrap up. Um, so without further ado, I am going to stop sharing my screen and hand the mic over to Serafina. Thank you, Anna. I got the mic. <laughs> So um, I have to give a big shout out to all the New Mexico people out there. I saw Miss Adriana. I see some Samia people. What's up? New Mexico is special. We're all special on this call, but New Mexico is extra special. Um, so I'm really curious for all of us to get a little sense of what experience anyone here has had with any USDA programming in this bucket. So United States Department of Agriculture is the big department that the NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, is under. Um, and so I'm hoping folks can use the raise hand function, which is in your reactions. If you see a little smiley face emoji, you can click on it and it'll give you a raise hand in the lower hand. So we're gonna go up and down a few times, um, but just wanted to jump in and say who here 
has registered, signed up with the Farm Service Agency. Yeah, let us know right on. So that's the FSA, Farm Service Agency. It's an acronym that's need to know in the conversation we're having. And they're the first step to being able to access NRCS programming. If you don't sign up and get a farm and track number with the Farm Service Agency, and there's a local office in not all counties, but many counties, and I'm sure we'll throw up in the chat a link to how to find those. Um, you can't apply for any NRCS programs. And there's a whole other bucket of support and assistance that comes to the Farm Service Agency that we're not gonna talk about, but good for you, everybody who signed up. You can lower your hand, awesome. Congratulations, you have taken, you've opened the door to opportunity by doing so. You've also ensured that your farm gets invited to be counted in the Ag Census which in New Mexico, we're super undercounted as small, rural, largely Indo-Hispano farms. And just like with the regular census, it can impact the resources that go to our regions. So there's an equity aspect. And um, you know, for this group, beginning farmers, we want beginning farmers and ranchers counted too. So I think you got my point on FSA. Here's the next question. How many here have ever applied to NRCS. It doesn't mean that you received a grant or it's not a grant. You're not supposed to use that word cost assistance, but okay, right on. My dogs are going to go crazy now. Great timing. Neighbors dropping by and honking at me. And that's all they're going to get is dog barks. Let me mute for one, one second. The joys of dog ownership. <laughs> okay, I have escaped to a room that's further away from the animals and visitors. Pardon the interruption. That's part of just how we roll in a rural community, stopping by for visits. Um, so I see a bunch of you have applied. It would be really cool if folks want to throw in the chat some of the practices that you've applied for. And that's a term that NRCS uses to describe, are you applying for irrigation practices, high tunnel practices, soil health initiatives. Um, Aaron's gonna go way deeper into what some of those options are and the cost share and reimbursement type of on-farm improvements. Um, right on high tunnel, That's that was my, it's a really good point of entrance to NRCS programs is the high tunnel work. So right on and feel free to keep sharing those because I think it's really helpful from a peer to peer experience to see what other people are interested in and what potentially is working for them. Um, and I think Aaron will touch on what some of the most popular programs are, but if we let him know what we're really interested in, he might be able to best speak to some of those programs too. So, um, and the last question I'm going to ask, well, main last question, so you can lower your hands if you put them up. Congratulations on applying. Um, way to go. And then the final one, have you received um, a contract or implemented an NRCS program? And so if you want to raise your hand, if you've implemented one, we can see who the, the veterans are in the crowd. Yeah, we got some folks with knowledge so you guys could be co-hosting with us up here. And what's up, CJ? Um, explaining your experience uh, right on. Good work. And one of the things you all have probably found, um, and I know I experienced, is that once you implement a practice and your neighbors find out about it, you become an emissary for these programs. And it just multiplies after that. So my mentor, I moved to New Mexico to work with Don Bustos, who's a visionary farmer in our region. And he was like the first guy in the North to do high tunnels. And then he did them and I did them and they're just like multiplied. And we see it in our arid um, 
high altitude climate as like a climate change, adapting to seasonal change um, strategy. So we've had a lot of fun. I don't love the plastic part, but we've had a lot of fun replicating that and creating a lot of farmer's market opportunities for folks. Um, and then lastly, if you haven't applied and you don't even know what the programs are, but just, you know, what's the kind of support you're looking for on your farm that you think brought you to this workshop? You know, what, what is it that you have a need for um, that you're hoping NRCS might be able to address? And if you want to throw that in the chat, oh my gosh, that's so cool. Another Dumbo still spin. Woo! He says woohoo. That's like his woohoo, by the way, if you know. Um, <laughs> and he changed my life. I wouldn't even be here in this whole chapter of my life if it wasn't for Dumbo still. Total homage. Anyhow, that's a longer story than we're here for today. So um, thank y'all for your input and your sharing and just like your engagement, like you're doing it and way to show up to this workshop just to get any tips and tricks you can. Um, I wanna talk briefly about why the New Mexico Acequia Association. And if you don't know the word Acequia, that's a traditional irrigation canal that's communally run. We're a local political government and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, but we work with farmers across the state to protect our water rights, our cultural traditions, and grow healthy food for our families. And um, we're doing this work really honoring and as a part of the legacy of Southern Black farmers who stood up and addressed injustice, systemic discrimination within the USDA, the um, United States Department of Agriculture, excluding a number of different um, communities. And in New Mexico, that was largely Indo-Hispano farmers and ranchers. In the South, in the case, the Pigford case that was settled in 2010, that was black farmers across the country, but especially in the South. And so many communities, including women at times have been historically marginalized, marginalized and kept out of these programs. And that funding and support for our farms and ranches was denied. NMAA gets a grant from the USDA to do outreach into um, historically underserved communities. And NRCS has changed a lot, even in the last decade or two. And we have some awesome folks in our local county offices who look and experience more of what our communities look like, as well as NRCS being a national org. So we have movement from across the country with folks who understand and are allied with local farms um, and ranches. So for us, it's part of our social justice mission to ensure that our communities who have in so many ways um, been historically disenfranchised, feel like they have a seat at the table and have access to these programs. So we do a lot of what we call handholding to get people their farm service um, registration done and to apply for these programs and to some lesser degree implement them. We also, um, we just went through a historic and tragic wildfire season in New Mexico, and we know with climate change, whether, you know, you're in the Midwest and you're getting flooding, these climate disasters are coming and they're coming hard and they're hitting farmers and ranchers particularly hard. Um, so we realized more than we ever had that EWP program, Emergency Watershed Program, Aaron referenced, you, you want to be a part of the system if you wanna access a lot of the disaster assistance. If you lose livestock, you need to be registered to the Farm Service Agency for the Livestock Indemnification Program, and I could go on. So registering with Farm Service Agency is an important step to being prepared for disasters um, and for some degree of relief, but also for some programs that can help mitigate and make us more resilient to disasters that come. Um, and in general, we think there's a lot of great strategies work for anything that helps our local farms be more viable. For us, um, growing food for community is a very deep value and something we really still depend on in Northern New Mexico. Um, but we also think the practices NRCS offers, offers can be useful in climate change adaptation overall. Um, I think the last few things that I would mention is that 
it is paperwork, it is bureaucracy, it's really none of our favorite things to be in the system and have to kind of follow um, the specs um, that are exterior to us, but I really encourage you all to explore um, the offerings to reach out to your local county offices, both of the Farm Service Agency and the NRCS in order to establish relationships, create a site visit. That's the number one after you do FSA. It's all about getting a site visit so you can learn more about what might work on your farm. Your local NRCS rep is an ally and someone who's there to give you technical assistance whether or not you want to apply for any programs to get feedback, to get support. Um, and so we just really encourage everyone to know the ins and outs of a contract before they're signing it. I have lots of thoughts on that. Um, and you know, then just go ahead and once you feel confident, jump in two feet first. But I think one of the best things is connecting with folks locally who've done a similar program and gaining lessons learned from them. Um, so with that, I just wish all of you a bountiful, happy, safe growing season that you find all the resources that you need. And if you are a farmer or rancher um, off in a sec in New Mexico, the NMAA is here to provide more detailed technical assistance. I'm looking forward to the rest of the meeting and potentially supporting with any questions you all have. And now you've seen my bathroom while we're at it too. <laughs> Thank you, Serafina. And um, if you could please put your contact information in the chat. Um, we also have a New Mexico NRCS staff here, Erin, who's gonna share a little more for those of you who may not be as familiar with who the Natural Resources Conservation Services is and what they do. Alrighty, thank you. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right, well, uh, again, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, again, my name is Aaron Reynolds, and I am a resource conservationist with the Natural Resource Conservation Service uh, based out of Albuquerque. For this first portion that I'm going to present on, it's mainly going to be around what NRCS is and what are two major programs um, we like to see. I know there's been a lot of mentioned of the EWP or the Emergency Watershed Protection Program. And um, at the end of the presentation, I can mention what that program is because it is significantly different than any of our other programs that we offer to people. And it's mainly based around natural disasters, um, fires and floods and things of that nature that pose a threat to human life and property. But uh, at this point in time, I'm not gonna go too much in depth on it. Um, so my contact information is on the slides and these slides will be shared with everyone, but I can also put my contact information in the chat for people. Um, so um, just giving a brief introduction about myself. Um, I've been with the agency going on 12 years now. Um, I've actually worked in multiple states. So I'm originally from Wisconsin where I grew up on a small farm and started with NRCS in the Midwest. Then I actually moved to Colorado and um, I, I worked out on the Eastern Plains on more conventional agricultural operations. And then I moved to New Mexico where I eventually ended up in Albuquerque as a resource conservationist or program manager. So uh, for those who don't know, NRCS is an agency within the United States Department of Agriculture. So this is a federal agency. And um, very commonly, we work with a lot of conservation districts locally in areas and other uh, organizations that assist farmers and ranchers to improve their uh, operations. But um, NRCS, or the Natural Resources Conservation Service, provides landowners with technical assistance and advice, advice for their land specifically. And one of the things I always like to mention to NRCS staff and also the landowners is that those local landowners know their land better than anybody else. You know, we just come in and try to help them improve their land and continue what they're trying to achieve on that land. 
So NRCS provides uh, common technical assistance in the area, will assess resource resources, and then will also come in with uh, practice design and resource monitoring. Um, all of this is done throughout the what we call the conservation planning process. And um, you know, it's a very fluid motions and it changes depending on what the needs of that landowner are. So that's just briefly where NRCS comes in is that we're a scientific, scientific and technical based agency that will assist uh, you know, landowners. And again, I'll get it more into the details of who's eligible and what are the requirements for our programs. But there is financial assistance to implement a lot of these programs. So um, for those who don't know, um, NRCS used to be called the Soil Conservation Service. And the roots of NRCS is um, based in the 1930s and the Dust Bowl. So if people um, can recall back to their um, history courses, the Dust Bowl was a time in American history where there was a lot of tillage occurring and soil in the air. And um, you know, the president at that time, so FDR actually saw the need to implement um, conservation nationwide. And thus that's how NRCS was born. Um, NRCS has evolved and I should say changed tremendously in recent years. And now our focus has expanded to um, soil, water, air, plant, and animals or our soil resource concerns. So um, it's a much different agency and it's a much broader agency than what it used to be. Uh, so as mentioned, I'm gonna, the two cost share programs that we have through NRCS are the EQIP program and CSP. So in simple terms, um, because we don't have enough time to go in depth on all these programs. So I'm just gonna give a brief summary of what each one of these programs are, and then we can build from there. So the first program that I'm gonna mention is the Environmental Quality Incentive Program. And uh, we call it short, we call it EQIP as its acronym. And it provides technical and financial assistance to producers to address uh, natural resource concerns, deliver environmental benefits through conservation practices to protect soil, water, air, and other natural resources concerns. And in simple terms, the way you look at this is EQIP treats specific concerns. And I'm going to provide a few scenarios of how EQIP is used, and then eventually our um, guest presenter that has actually implemented this can describe how they install these practices. So as mentioned, EQIP is very specific. You have one resource concern that you're trying to treat. So um, one of the common uh, comments that I saw was a lot of people utilize them for high tunnels. And when high tunnels are installed, which um, I guess real briefly what a high tunnel is, a high tunnel is a structure that is covered in plastic that extends your growing season. So you can start, for example, your cool season crops earlier or get some of those warm season crops to go a little later, depending on what you need them. So through EQIP, um, you could receive cost share on the high tunnel itself, the irrigation inside that high tunnel. Um, there are some specific requirements on the irrigation and what's needed to meet the installing irrigation, but you could have the irrigation, you could have nutrient management, which is testing your soil and get an idea of you know, how, how much of nutrients do I need in my soil to achieve my desired um, yield goal? And then also um, there's things like pest management to manage uh, disease and other pests that could damage you. And then also one called irrigation water management to better manage your water usage on your property. And, you know, that's just one specific example of how EQIP could be used for this. Um, you know, eventually I'll talk about some of the land uses that EQIP could be used on, you know, because it can range from forestry, it can range from rangeland, pasture, cropland. So there's a, it's a 
variable program that gives you a lot of flexibility depending on what your specific needs are for this program. Um, then the next program I'm gonna mention, and this isn't one of the programs I manage specifically, um, but it's called our Conservation Stewardship Program. And simply put, the Conservation Stewardship Program, the goal of the program is to build on good conservation that you're already doing. So you're far, if you're already testing your soil, if you're already monitoring your water, it assists those producers to take it to a next level and do more advanced forms of those conservation systems. And specifically on the CSP program that makes it unique is in order to be eligible for CSP, um, you have to sign up for five years at one time. EQIP doesn't have that requirement. EQIP can be a one and done up to 10 years to get your work done, but you won't be tied into the program through EQIP. Um, and then that's gonna be just a pretty good summary of the programs. Um, eventually, I will talk about some of the eligibility of the programs and what all goes into um, actually signing up. So I'll go ahead and hand it off to the next presenter. All right, well, I'm just gonna jump in then um, and say hello to everybody. I think I'm next, is that right? Um, all right, so my name's Ellie. For those of you that weren't on the call yet, um, I'm from Solidarity Farm, and um, I am going to share my screen so that you guys can see some pictures of um, what we do. All right. So what I'm excited to talk to you today is, is how we've leveraged NRCS and combined it with other resources to make it really work for our farm. Um, and just wanna start by saying that, you know, Solidarity Farm is a modest sized farm. Um, we, we produce um, diversified fruits and vegetables and we collaborate with our neighbors um, through a small farm distribution company called Food Shed. Um, and, you know, we, um, well, we farm probably at any given time about five out of those 10 acres, and we've been doing it for about 10 years. Um, so I'm going to start just by telling you guys a story about a really important year, which was 2017. Um, we, you know, had just really gotten our feet under us and had, had crops in the ground and were selling commercially, and our kids were involved on the farm. Um, and we had a heat event that was about 122 degrees following a winter of severe freezing. And um, we understood that if we didn't get serious about um, really investing in our soil and figuring out how to be more resilient, that we were not going um, to be able to continue farming. And we really wanted our kids to, to see that, you know, you can adapt to challenges. Um, and that you have to adapt in order, um, in order to survive. So that was really our, our impetus. And so we came up with these four goals. Um, and I also really quick want to give a shout out. Um, about that time, um, we had an um, a intern or an apprentice come to stay on the farm named Andy Williamson, who's on the call today, um, who really pushed us also to, to try out some of these practices. So um, I just want to acknowledge him um, and how important he was to us. Um, but we decided that if we wanted to keep farming, we really need to, needed to invest in four things, right? We needed to keep our soil covered. We needed to improve water delivery efficiency. We needed to reduce evaporation that was caused by wind. And we needed to buffer against cold and heat events with better infrastructure. And, and that's a picture of the barn that was toppled by the winds that um, we get these winds called Santa Ana's out in, in San Diego. And so um, we really, you know, it was that same year that that barn fell down. Um, and so just sharing that the impacts um, that pushed us were pretty severe. I realize I'm talking too quickly. I'm gonna slow down for interpretation. Um, and so in our need, in our desire to address these four, um, these four issues, we looked around for allies and resources. Um, and obviously today we're gonna, um, we're talking about NRCS. Um, 
But I just want to acknowledge that there were three other resources that we, we really relied on. One is called the Healthy Soils Program, um, which is a California state program. Uh, Zero Food Print, which is a private um, foundation that leverages money for um, through restaurants um, for regenerative agriculture, and then the Coastal Conservancy. And I just want to point out that, you know, we need, as farmers, we need to, to leverage all of these resources and find out what's happening in our area, because there really isn't a one-size-fit-all program um, that can help us get the job done. So here are the practices that we have implemented. Um, with an NRCS conservation um, EQIP grant, we have been able to put in hedgerows and windbreaks. Um, we've improved our irrigation efficiency. So we used a lot of lay flat to move the water all the way across our farm. Um, and we were able with NRCS funds to put those pipes underground um, and get, you know, um, new new outlets closer to the fields that we were working in um, and uh, two high tunnels in, in our first round of EQIP. Um, our Healthy Soils Grant um, from California Department of Food and Agriculture let us address um, cover cropping and reducing tillage um, on our farm. Zero Food Print brought in the compost that we needed and the Coastal Conservancy um, helped us to or supported our perennial some of our perennial transition and allowed us to use native more drought tolerant seed in our cover crop, which was really important to Southern California, but wasn't something that was affordable, um, given that the NRCS practice really covered, you know, cheaper seed like barley. So some of the challenges um, to consider, words of wisdom um, for things that we learned. Um, as short-term renters, our landlords had to agree to facilitate this process. Um, we were really grateful that our landlords saw the benefit um, and they led on this. Um, we found that NRCS was busy, our local office was busy, and we had to be persistent to get our first meeting. Um, and this is the part that I think is really important for smaller scale farms. And I, I saw in the chat when we were getting started that people are already kind of aware of this, but, um, you know, a lot of these programs are cost reimbursement. And so it requires really thoughtful planning and partnership, um, to really think about how you're going to fork out the money for these practices and then wait for reimbursement. Um, and I thought it was really interesting that NRCS could not tell us how much something might cost to actually implement in our area. Um, they really could only tell us what the reimbursement rate was. Um, and so that was a little intimidating um, because you know, you're getting into it without really knowing what, how expensive everything's gonna be. So do your homework and build a budget for yourself and don't assume that the cost is actually gonna cover what you need for your area. And um, the other thing is that um, your local NRCS office may not have the expertise that you need in house. So we live in an area that's very, um, it's full of citrus and avocado farmers. And so our local technical uh, advisors are really great at citrus and avocado, but they don't have a lot of knowledge about row crops. And so you need to advocate um, that your NRCS folks reach outside of their comfort zone um, and, and to other, ally, you know, other um, staff in NRCS who have that expertise. And then finally, you need to account for specialized equipment needs um, as you apply for the practice. So something like if you're putting in cover crop and you're reducing tillage, you might need access to a no-till seed drill, um, but you you know, you don't want to or can't afford to go out and buy one just for the practice, right? Or you might need to rent scaffolding to be able to put up your high tunnel, or you might need a mulch spreader um, that, that you don't quite have yet. So really think about what you actually need to implement and if it's even available in your area. So ways to overcome um, some of these barriers. Um, I do want to say that bringing, you know, advocating and bringing that NRCS person out early 
um, and then trusting the process um, is is really important. Um, don't do too much homework um, before you actually bring them out to your farm. Um, you can ask um, a resource conservation district or other TA providers in your area to connect you with a mentor, another farmer who's done this work before, um, I think is really, would be really, really helpful and advised. Um, and you can advocate for overlapping your practices. So the field prep plus the irrigation plus the planting so that you can maximize the reimbursement um, and make sure you can actually cover your costs. Um, and this one I think is really important. Um, to overcome that barrier of cost reimbursement, you can find a lending partner that understands the NRCS program. So I noticed someone was here from FarmLink today, California FarmLink, or even the Farm Service Agency. If you have an NRC, if you have a um, NRCS equip contract, um, you should be able to get a loan, right, to match that contract. And then when you get paid back by NRCS, you could use that money to pay back the loan. Now, the terms and the length and all that is something to consider, but it could be a really great opportunity to build your credit and to, and to make those two sort of programs mesh together. And then finally, um, you can look for contractors um, that, can, that you can pay with NRCS funds to help you install the practice. So for example, this is a picture um, of a gentleman from Fresno. So Fresno's way north in California. We had to pay him to drive his no-till seed drill all the way down because one didn't exist to do our cover cropping practice in San Diego. Um, but he had the expertise and he just busted it out and it actually ended up being more affordable than if we had tried to figure out how to broadcast it or do it ourselves. So definitely look for people who can help you with the practices. Um, because we're farmers and, and really implementing this practice, these practices is all about our bottom line. Um, I wanted to share some of the impacts that this programs have had for us. Um, we have definitely seen a reduction in losses during extreme weather events um, because of the practices that we've implemented. We've seen our soil organic matter increase from about the, the, you know, the normal threshold, which is about 1% to 7% in some of the areas that we've really been applying these soil building techniques. Um, that additional soil organic matter has a huge impact um, on reducing our water bill. And um, the hedgerows also have had a big impact in reducing the wind that's directly hitting the beds that are behind them. And that also has an impact on reducing our summer water bill. Um, we've also seen improved pollination rates and yields near the hedgerows, although we're just really starting to be able um, to monitor that as our hedgerows are getting bigger. Um, and we've seen, this is a big one, we've seen improved infiltration um, and reduced flooding during heavy rain um, events. And we've seen financial gains from um, the season extension that our high tunnels bring. That's really a huge one and why I think high tunnels are the most popular uh, or one of the most popular NRCS practices. And then finally, you know, really investing into bringing this diversity onto our farm gives us an opportunity to bring education um, and other types of activities onto the farm. So this is an herbalism class for kids um, and, and just wanted to kind of share that um, there are sort of benefits outside of just the economic ones um, to your community. So I'll close with that. This is my contact information um, and happy to, you know, kind of connect and, and answer any questions y'all might have. Wow, congratulations. Those are some really huge successes to uplift. Um, and more specifically, we wanted to go into a few of those programs, some that uh, Solidarity Farms using others that you've heard mentioned. Um, and also, if you're having any trouble keeping track of the different acronyms being thrown around, I did post in the chat a key uh, acronym sheet, as well as steps for receiving USDA assistance. 
And then we're gonna pass it back to Aaron to, to go into more specifics. Great, thank you. And Ella, that was great to hear that story and hear the, the local benefits and your goals being met on that operation. Um, real quick before I get into the presentation, um, I'm a big fan of soil health. I like hearing that you're implementing soil health and helping the system just reach its natural state because our soil is so unhealthy at this point. So that's great to hear you're, you know, reaching for those goals to improve your soil, which ultimately is going to make your pocketbook a lot bigger as well. So I, I'm, that's very great to hear. So um, I'll bring up my slides again. Um, and I, Elliot was talking about the high tunnels. This was a high tunnel I actually worked on in New Mexico um, and Southwest in the Gila that we installed for him. And you can see the benefit this is having for him specifically. So um, what I'm gonna review today is I'm going to briefly review the um, application process through NRCS. There is a link that does go a bit more in depth that you can follow that's been posted in the chat. Um, and it just explains all these different sections from the planning, uh, application, eligibility, ranking, and then the implementation as well. And I'll mention a little bit about the implementation towards the end of this presentation as well and how the reimbursement program works and some of the things I like to recommend to a lot of the farmers to implement the practices and um, not go belly up and afford to do the good, the good conservation work as well. Um, so as mentioned, um, Almost every county has an NRCS office in there, but there are going to be a few scenarios where there's not an office there. And with how NRCS programs work, it's very personal and it's based on your operation. So we need to go out to your operation really to help you. You know, we can talk to you at our desk and say, here's what we think you need, but we ultimately can't make that decision until we go out to your specific farm, ranch, or, you know, forest stand. Uh, so if you're unsure of where your office is located, you can follow that link to find it. You can um, just match it to what county you're located in and go from there. Once you find where your office is located, you can then fill out a, uh, C what we call a CPA 1200, or for simple purposes, it's our application that you can fill out. And you can actually go into the office and fill it in at the office. And we can make sure we can kind of line you up, make recommendations of you know how who you need to go and see and where you would need to go. And one thing NRCS did just implement recently is we now do have applications and other contract documentation in multiple language. So, um, you know, in most cases, the staff will hand a application in English, but if you are looking for another language, just let that local field staff know, and they can get you um, an application in um, another language. And there's numerous, I want to say it's, I don't even know how many total languages, but there are a lot of languages that the application forms are offered in now. After that, um, if you haven't already, you, I guess it's uh, it's up to you how you, you would want to proceed. Um, you can come to our office at any time and we can take an application. But one thing we will need from you is we will need so, you to go to the Farm Service Agency, so FSA, and register with them. And uh, if you ever have any issues on that paperwork, you can either go to them or we can help you fill out a lot of that information because it can be a little complicated and you know there is a lot of red tape, but it is necessary. And all the information um, that FSA collects or NRCS collects, we don't share with anyone. We um, view that as very important information and it's very personal. So when you apply, you don't need to worry about uh, any identity theft or anything like that because we will protect your information and we're not gonna share it with anyone else. Uh, around the country. 
So after you go through that process of filling in an application, you know, as Ellie mentioned, um, it's good to get an NRCS out there right away. And um, then we can go out to your property. We can walk around with you. We can identify what your specific concerns are. And we can also identify additional concerns as well. Um, you know, as I mentioned, some of the resource concerns we're going to be looking at are soil, water, air, plant, and animal. And obviously, we go a lot more in depth than that. Um, as, Ellie meant, as Ellie was talking, you know, for soil, we do stuff with soil health. But if it's water, we'll do work with water quantity, water quality, things of that nature. And real quick, just taking a step back, one thing I did want to mention is we do take applications year round. We do have set deadlines that are established every year, but regardless of a time, you can come into our office and submit an application for, for possible funding. And we'll just roll you into when the next signup occurs and work with you in that ranking process. So never hesitate to submit an application for NRCS programs. You know, our door is always open. Um, so going into the programs, and these are true with any of our programs, uh, whether it be EQIP or CSP, um, who is eligible to apply for our programs? As you can see on the screen, it varies from an individual just based on your social security number, it could be a legal entity if you're in a corporation or a partnership. Uh, it could be a joint operation. Uh, we do help the tribes if they wish to sign up. Uh, there are some different rules. And um, in some areas, I know in New Mexico, this is a very big deal. Our water management entities are very influential and historic in the state of New Mexico. And simply put, um, a water management entity is a governing body that has jurisdiction over water usage. And they can actually enter into a contract with an RCS to improve um, water distribution for their property. So it could actually impact most multiple people. So just keep in mind that uh, acequias and irrigation districts are eligible for our funding. But in most cases, it's either gonna be your individual or legal entity. Um, another important aspect of our programs is control of land. And uh, specifically when it comes to control of land, um, NRCS can enter into a contract with one or more participants that have control of the offered land. And when we talk control of land, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to own that land, but you can also be renting that land. And then also depending on how you're planning your contract, you don't have to show control for the entire length of the contract. So if you're on a year-to-year -year lease, like a lot of uh, renters are, um, we you can update that lease every year and still be eligible for contracting. So don't feel like you wouldn't be eligible if you don't own the land or you don't have you know a five-year lease. That doesn't matter. We look at um, control of land every single year. So just remember that you know it can be a lease, you know a lease rent or a permit. Um, and when I say permits, that's relating to federal land, whether it be BLM, BIA, or I should say Bureau of Land Management, Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, those acres can be included as well. Um, next, I'm talking about land types specifically. And when I say land types, um, it's pretty much how the land is used. And just to give you an idea on a some of the eligible land types that NRCS will contract on is um, we do have cropland, which can either be rural, like in the photo on the right on the top, or it can be just your conventional ag as on the right. And uh, I know I saw a few mentions of um, silviculture and trees, and we do lump in that type of land use into the crop fund pool. So there is some flexibility when it comes to that. Um, a few of the other eligible land uses are pasture, which is irrigated and grazed by livestock, rangeland, which is grazed by livestock, which is a term used in the Western USA for where the cattle graze. We do have forest, industrial or non-industrial. And when we say forest, it was historically forest land. And that's where we do a lot of fire management practices 
and um, even some grazing practices if it's grazed forest. And then also uh, associated ag land and farmsteads. So after we identify that you are eligible for our programs, we do go into a ranking process. Sadly, um, not everybody is funded in the program, but there is a set amount of dollars set aside for those practices. So I won't go in depth because there's a few other things I wanna review um, later on. And specifically it's on what we call historically underserved applications and when we use this term, it's members of groups have been his, historically underserved or um, have been subject to discrimination in federal programs. So there's actually set dollars for um, these producers and it's actually at a higher cost share rate as well. And a socially disadvantaged individual um, or entity is a member excuse me, individual or entity who is a member of a socially disadvantaged group. Socially disadvantaged groups consist of the following. So American Indians or Alaskan Native, Asians, Black or African Americans, Native Hawaiians or Pacific Islanders, and Hispanics. Um, sadly, um, just being female alone doesn't qualify for socially disadvantaged. These are just rules that were set in policy, but it's still important to know if you qualify for any of these. Um, another common one that I think we're going to see happening more often with urban agriculture is uh, beginning farmers. So someone who hasn't farmed or ranch for uh, more than 10 years, if you qualify for that, you actually receive a higher payment rate than you would normally. And then the veteran farmer and rancher is just um, a beginning farmer that has veteran status. Um, and then the last one is the limited resource farmer or rancher. And um, with direct or indirect gross sales, not more than the current index value in each of the previous two years, and who has a total household income at or below the national poverty level level for family of four or less than 50% of the county median household income in each of the previous two years. So those are just some of the terms that, um, you know, it's important that you guys remember that you're eligible for those programs or eligible for those definitions. Um, and then I guess what we can do is I did provide a few links as mentioned, and if people have specific questions about um, the payment process, I can cover that uh, later on just so we can keep things rolling along. So at that, um, that's just a very fast rundown of our programs. Yes, thank you so much, Aaron. And I, I appreciate you also keeping it Brief, I know that that is a lot of information and I'm sure for the audience to receive as well. Um, and for our interpreter um, who's asked us in the chat um, as we right now enter into the question and answer part of uh, this workshop. This is really for you all who've joined us taking time out of your day. Um, if you have questions directly for some of our speakers or more generalized question. Um, what you could do is raise your hand and then come off mute um, by, you know, the 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 first to, to raise their hands and we'll make sure to get through everyone. Also, if you'd like to, you're more than welcome to put your question in the chat. Um, and my friend and our co-presenter, Serafina, is going to help me keep track of all of the different questions. Um, I do see one right now. And uh, just to remind ourselves, when we ask these questions, if we can keep a conversational pace for interpretation, uh, that way, some of these questions you may have others who are joining on our Spanish channel or who will be watching the recording recording later can also keep track. Thank you all. I do see um, Adiola and, and maybe you could say how you pronounce your name. I definitely wanna say it right. Yeah, thank you guys for this workshop. Um, you pronounced it correctly, Adiola is my name. Um, and my question is, um, in regards to the last speaker, if he could answer this question, I have applied for, I don't know if you guys can answer this question, but I've applied for um, an equip program in my state and <clears throat> I followed all the procedures that you mentioned. However, 
And I actually applied before the deadline for my particular state, maybe a, a few days before, because that was when I learned about it. But I haven't heard anything back from them. What would you suggest that would be my next steps? Because I've reached out to the person that was in my that was my contact uh, twice. She did reply to me once, um, but I have yet to hear back from her. So uh, I wanted to find out what should be my next steps. Should I contact her again, or should I go up to the office, or what should I do? Yeah. So in the and thanks for your question. So in that scenario, I know it can be frustrating when they haven't. Um, responded back to you. I what you need to do is kind of multi, you kind of need to be a little bit of persistent and a bit of thorn in our side. If we're not responding to you, I would show up at the office. I'd call us. You know, if you don't even get anywhere there, if you use that locator that was mentioned, you can actually look at um, contacting people higher up the chain as well. If you do find that that field office isn't responding to you, I mean, ideally they should. Uh, be responding to you as soon as possible, but I would start becoming a bit of a squeaky wheel and making sure you're being heard. And, um, you know, again, it can get complicated for a lot of our staff when it's continuous sign up because they just want to focus on here's what I'm working on at this point in time. But in reality, we need to be um, consistently taking applications and consistently helping people. Thank you so much. I just didn't want to seem like a nuisance, but I've heard from you and I've also heard from Ellie. Thanks, Ellie, for your response. Can I just, one thing I'd add is that it's hard. I know in New Mexico, a lot of our offices are understaffed and there's like, so, and I work in an understaffed office, so not NRCS, but I feel for staff who's overwhelmed and we have to get responses, but just, you know, because we're often friends with our local folks in the offices, it reminds us like, Linda, why aren't you gonna talk to us? We recently found out there was like a multiple month turnaround to get a farm service number, which in my mind is like a week turnaround kind of thing. Um, and that also, I think, Aaron, it can be helpful to know, like, depending on how things work in your state, but it can be a couple months between when you put in an application, their batching period, and when they're actually deciding who they're offering contracts to. So asking the office their timeline can help you have more clear expectations of when they're actually blowing you off or they just are like, we have no information. And I would just say, you know, echoing, it's hard. It's hard patience, persistence game. Y'all got this. Yeah, Thank and, you. and to, to, to add to that um, as well, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. You can go ahead. Sorry, whoever had questions next. Well, can I just jump in here really quick? Um, I just wanna say, I super appreciate that, um, everyone's being so straightforward about what we have to do. But um, I, I also just wanna lift this up as a national policy issue. Um, and that the, the amount of gatekeeping on funding um, is, is hugely problematic. And we need to untie the hands of our, our friends at these offices um, so that they can push funding out quicker um, and we have an opportunity maybe in the farm bill or just any chance that we have, I think, to get in front of decision makers. Um, we need to be talking about this because we shouldn't have to go into the office. We shouldn't have to wait months and months. Like we're trying to steward land and solve climate and address climate change. And, and it, we can't take excuses that people are just too busy. Um, especially when you're a farmer, someone giving you that is that excuse like falls on pretty like closed ears. So um, like I said, I appreciate Aaron and, you know, Serafina being so honest, but um, yeah. And, and like Hector says, the funding's there. We just have to like make it flow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, that, and, and just to speak to that as well, we, the field staff can only control so much when it gets to them. And what my comment was going to be is timelines, deadlines, and all that information vary from state to state. So you really need to be in contact with your local state. But in general, we post all of our information online of when our ranking deadline is. So you can always go to the NRCS state website and see when those deadlines are. And um, from there, um, it also established application deadlines, ranking deadlines, and it gives you all that information. So we have to post those deadlines you know, 30 days prior to when they occur. So at the same time as NRCS needs to help, um, 
some of the people applying need to be on the spot as well and understand what they're applying for and have all their affairs in order. So if information's missing, that slows us down. But um, definitely, it, uh, you know, we can only control so much of where money is spent and where it isn't. And for people that feel like they're not getting funded, um, you really need to talk to your local work groups. So a lot of those conservation districts that help NRCS establish where our dollars are spent. So it's not as simple as we can just say, oh, you want to put in a high tunnel, here's some money. You know, we do have to go through a process and sadly we're not able to establish those process processes um, to get you funding. But um, I know field staff isn't intentionally trying to ignore you or not treat your concerns, but um, please continue just to work with your local field staff. And if it does go on silent ears, um, you know, eventually start looking at some of the hires higher up in the states and your state office employees. And we'll also share a little more um, at the end of this presentation, our efforts to um, really influence and push the NRCF's offices. I did want to address, and I heard it come up in that question and in some of the responses. I want to, um, before going to the person with their hand raised, uh, I think these questions could be answered maybe as, you know, they're along the similar line of thought. Um, how often is funding made available? And if you don't get funded when you apply, are you able to the following year? And then I guess along with that, um, Hector asked, uh, where do you find the grant cycles for all of the programs? Um, and that way people can apply within those cycles. Um, and I think, you know, Aaron, you partly addressed this in sharing that it really is state specific. Um, but if you could speak to ways that people can keep track of that and um, so that they don't miss the application and grant cycles. Um, and I think also along with that, um, how long do you have to be established to be able to apply for those? Okay. Yep. So I'll just go right down the list of the comments of how often is funding made available. So it really depends. But in general, we do funding applications individually for each program. So it does happen every single year. Now, in the scenario, you don't rank high enough to get the funding. Um, you will be sent a letter asking, would you like to defer your application into the next year? So if you do choose to defer that application, it will be rolled over into the following year. But what I would encourage you, if you're constantly applying and not getting funding, talk to your field staff about treating additional or additional resource concerns that they found on your property. Because in general, the more resource concerns you treat, the higher likelihood you have to be funded. So if you're uh, just coming in every year saying, all I want is a high tunnel, I don't want anything else, you're, you're not going to have as high of options to get funding if you were planting a cover crop to treat soil health or if you're doing pollinator habitat, you're treating more resource concerns. So definitely be flexible in what you're willing to do. And you know if you really need to get funded, you might have to treat those additional resource concerns as well. And then going into the next... Um, question was on the grant cycles. Um, we have a continuous sign up, as I mentioned. So bring your application to the office right away uh, when you want to apply for our programs. And then if you are curious about when our deadlines are, I encourage you to link to your local state NRCS website where we are required to post when our deadlines are. Um, it's a federal law that we let everyone know when those occur and, um, you know, they're publicly seen. So when it comes to um, officially established, we don't have any requirements on how long you have to be in operation in order to be eligible for our programs. Um, regardless of type of operation, the size of your operation, location or the overall income of your operation, that doesn't matter. As long as you fill out our application, you go and get eligible with the FSA, you will be able to apply for our programs. 
Now, specifically when it starts getting into uh, work with irrigation, we do have to identify irrigation history and you would have to have irrigated those um, acres for two out of the last five years. And specifically with that comment as well, when it comes to cropland, is it has to be active cropland. It can't be just grassland that you're going to farm. You need to be actively farming that land at the time you apply. And then you'd be eligible for our cropland practices. So I'm just gonna emphasize what Aaron said. If you're trying to break fallow ground and you want NRCS practices on that land, you do that first and yes. maybe wait a year. So when they come to the site visit, they're like, yeah, this looks like agriculture as opposed yeah. to, it looks like foul land I want help on. Yeah, yeah, and to, to go in depth, we can't convert land to something else that it isn't. You know, we do have set guidelines and we're not trying to, you know, put more acres into production because just um, production by itself isn't a resource concern we treat. Great, thank you. And we have a, we have a hand raise if you wanna come off mute. Hi, this is Chi Zhou. I'm the equity program manager from California Association of RCDs. I, oh, I'm located in San Jose in California, Santa Clara County. And in our county, we have 130 Asian farmers. And most of those Asian farmers are Chinese farmers, Japanese farmers, Korea farmers, and Vietnamese farmers. And we are talking about a group of people that is really isolated. They don't speak any English and they produce their produce and then sell to the local Asian stores. So there is no English needed for them to produce and successful for the farm. They have never heard about an RCS. They don't know those ex wonderful progr programs exist. So for the past three years, I was working as an extension specialist and I introduced this equip program to them and all of them are so interested and they want to apply. So I'm asking here, does NRCS have a uh, kind of a brochure or kind of flyer for different kinds of programs and the eligibility in different languages so that I can send in this information to those groups to the group of growers, instead of me talking to them individually, because I have my full-time job and I am too busy to talk to each farmers. So, uh, and thanks for your questions. NRCS does perform a lot of outreach in those communities. Um, you know, actually on another leadership project I'm working on, we are looking at ways to improve outreach to a lot of those communities, whether it be on the radio or specifically go into their meetings. What I would encourage yourself to do is reach out to the local field staff and have them come and give a presentation at, you know, a meeting you organize to reach those producers. Because for NRCS, it's very hard to reduce or reach out to a lot of the people. Um, you know, because we're so busy with uh, programs and other technical assistance. So work with your local staff to put on events. NRCS can host events and we can gear it towards specific communities as well to improve that outreach. Because I would agree, NRCS does need to do a better job, um, you know, letting people know that we're here and that we can help anyone, uh, you know, regardless of where they're at or who they are. Okay, thank you, Erin, for your uh, answer. And I have a small little answer uh, question too. Are those funding that the growers receiving, do they have to pay tax? Yes, they do. Technically okay. they do. Got yeah. it, got it. Yeah, and real quick on that comment as well, NRCS programs, when it comes to EQIP, we cost share, um, the cost share is meant to only be a 75% cost share. So keep in mind that when people apply for NRCS programs, we're not necessarily going to pay for everything included. We're only going to pay for a portion of that cost. So it is important that um, you're aware and who's ever applying is aware that there might be some monetary requirement on whoever is applying. 
Okay. You guys have so many good questions and you're going to go so far with this. I'm going to add one word of wisdom. I was on Medicaid when I first applied and I had to really calculate like, will this 1099 mess up my eligibility so I can stay on Medicaid? No, it didn't because that's how we're living at that point. But for anyone who's, you know, a part of one of those programs, you want to really eyes wide open is my my um, general phrase on how to approach all of this because there's so many benefits. You just want to make sure um, there's you don't get tripped up. Once you sign that contract, you want to be really ready and know you can implement it. Because if you can't, there can be penalties and challenges. But overall, we're hoping everyone finds a way to have a positive experience and especially pre appreciate everyone who's getting this out to communities who don't have as much access. So amazing questions. Um, we're going to move on to the next segment of our agenda, but I just wanna say it's been really fun to visit with all of you. And I'm, I'm hoping everyone gets into all the programs and gets all the support that they hope for and need. Anna, I'll pass it to you. Yes, and I keep invite, inviting questions. We will have, again, all of the speakers put their contact information in the chat. Especially if you have, I can hear a lot of questions geared toward Erin. I would really also encourage you to look up and reach out to your local NRCS office. And feel free as well to reach out to myself um, and our water director, Erin, who's going to be sharing a little of um, how we are working to shift the, shift the needle and see changes um, in NRCS programming and alongside uh, the Farm Bill in USDA. Um, so Erin, if you want to kick us off. Yeah, thanks, Anna, and thanks so much to Serafina and Erin and Ellie for being here to share about these programs. Um, like Anna said, I'm just going to be talking a little bit about the work that National Young Farmers Coalition is doing. Um, on NRCS programs, on water and climate issues. So I'm just going to share a little bit about what we do. Uh, we do have a water campaign called Generations for Water at National Young Farmers Coalition. Before I go into that, just wanted to share a little bit for those of you who may not be too familiar with National Young Farmers Coalition, just who we are and what we do. We are a grassroots network of over 200,000 farmers, ranchers, uh, supporters, advocates, and we are working to shift power and change policy to more equitably resource the new generation of working farmers. And we envision a just future where farming is free of racial violence, accessible to communities, oriented towards environmental well-being, and connected with health over profit. So that's just a little bit about um, the work that we're doing at National Young Farmers Coalition. It includes our water work. We also work on um, land access, uh, climate, economic justice, student loan debt. Uh, so if you're interested in getting involved in some of those other campaigns, we can plug you into those as well. Um, but I am going to focus uh, just a bit on our water work, which is most connected with these NRCS programs. Uh, we believe that water systems should foster vibrant agricultural communities, healthy ecosystems, and water justice for indigenous communities and other communities of color. So when we're looking at public policy, we want public policy that's going to be protecting water for agriculture, supporting on-farm conservation, that can serve and protect our clean water resources, programs like EQIP that Erin has been talking about, um, and ensuring access to clean drinking water. So we do this in a number of ways. Water issues can be super hyper local. It can be really international. It's global. Uh, well, we hear a lot the challenges that young farmers are facing are related to drought, flooding, and water quality issues. Um, so we work on policy, but we know that can't be solved through federal policy alone. So we also work to build farmer leadership. We put on educational events like this and form partnerships to support farmers to be leaders in water policy and conservations. So I just wanna tell you a little bit about what that looks like in practice for our farmer leadership work. We run fellowship programs. I saw a few of our water fellows on here uh, to do more in-depth training on water issues at the state and federal level and support 
young farmers and ranchers um, and BIPOC farmers and ranchers to not just learn about these issues, but step into leadership positions where they can be decision makers on our water policy. We do educational workshops like this one. We've got another one coming up next week that I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so if you just want some information on uh, what are the resources available to you, uh, we'll be keeping in touch about different educational workshops that we have going on. And then we do a lot of policy work. Right now we're focused on the Farm Bill. I think Ellie mentioned that a little bit. Uh, the Farm Bill is kind of the big, big federal policy piece on food and farm programs that's happening this year. Congress is starting to rewrite that. Um, so we're going to be working a lot on Farm Bill advocacy. Um, and then we also work on um, access and accountability to USDA. So I heard a little bit of feedback here on how accessing those NRCS programs have been going. Um, so we can help with that, help hold USDA and NRCS accountable to the commitments that they've made and provide feedback on how those programs are working for young farmers. Um, so here are some ways that you can stay in touch with us. Um, this is our first workshop in a, a short series this, um, this spring on how to use federal resources, um, to support conservation and also manage risk when it comes to drought, floods, freezes. We're going to be talking more about those disaster programs next week. Um, Anna, I think he's going to throw in the chat the registration for that next workshop if you're interested in um, federal programs that can help you support you if there's a disaster. And then we're going to be putting on our third workshop on World Water Day. That'll be more celebratory. Um, connecting, networking, and getting to know you all a little bit more in March for World Water Day. Another way to stay um, involved with us and is touch is work with us to connect with your local and state NRCS leaders. Erin mentioned you can connect with your field staff, you can connect with staff um, at the state level or federal level too. So if you have feedback that you want to provide on how those programs are going, let us know and we're happy to help you make those connections. Um, we've got a few other resources. We have a national survey report that has more information on young farmers across the country, the water challenges that they're facing and how they're addressing those. Um, so check out our survey report. You can also share your own story. Um, if you don't see that included in the survey, Anna is awesome at helping you lift up your story, whether that's with local policymakers your members of Congress, your local NRCS office, the press. Uh, if you have a short story you want to share around water, uh, connect with Anna and we can help you do that. Um, we're also going to have some more fellowship cohorts coming up. I mentioned we do water fellowship programs um, to support farmer leadership. Uh, so keep in touch. We're going to have um, a new one we're planning to la launch towards the end of this year. And then uh, last, if you want to work with us, especially on Farm Bill Advocacy, we have a place where you can sign up, uh, let us know, and you'll be getting more information there. And Anna's going to throw that link in the chat. Um, so that's the best way to stay in touch with what's happening at Young Farmers and with our water campaign. And just so you know who to talk to, um, We've got a small but mighty team on our water team. I'm our water director. Anna is our water organizer. And we also have a fellowship coordinator, Megan Davey, who I think I saw on this call. Uh, we'll throw our contact information in the chat if you want to be in touch. And I think that's all I have. Anna, I will pass it back to you to wrap us up. Thank you to all of our speakers. They provided so much valuable information and also to everybody who joined from across the country. It's so incredible to see people doing amazing work, even from what I can tell in the chat. And um, yeah, I wish to have more time with each of you, especially if you're interested. I hear a lot of feedback for NRCS and they need to hear it directly from you. Um, we have organizers across the country in different states who are working to set up um, meetings. Uh, there's folks like Hector, a California organizer on the call. Um, 
but I would suggest California folks reaching out to uh, if you don't already know Hector. Um, those are our opportunities when we go and meet with NRCS staff, just like our Congress people. These are decision makers um, and folks who uh, can communicate up the line to USDA staff what we need to see um, both in the farm bill and in the offices across the country to make it more accessible for all of you to use and harness these programs and the funding that is out there. Um, and I hope that you all are able to, I hope this was uh, valuable information that you're able to walk away with. Um, and if there's questions, like I said, this is not our last opportunity to connect. Um, you have several times uh, my contact information, the other speakers as well. Um, if you'd like to stay up to date, we will have a newsletter. That link is posted in the chat um, as well. Uh, I encourage you all uh, to reach out to others at Young Farmers, those you've met on the call, um, and continue doing the amazing work. Uh, again, thank you all for joining us. And I hope to see you next week um, or, you know, to share, like I said, feel free to share any of the information and recordings from this workshop with others you think will benefit. Um, good luck with all of your endeavors and I hope you all have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you.